All right, guys, so I hope you're all going well. So first things first I'll say is that this is currently, I don't know how many takes I've tried of this um, video because my camera's overheated twice on me now. So I've currently got, I've currently got an ice block. <laughs> One of those, you know, those ice blocks you put in the freezer on top of my camera to try and stop it overheating. So hopefully this time we'll get through it okay. But um, even in recognition of that, even if you don't like the video, if you could please give me a like, that would be very much appreciated. <laughs> okay, so look, let's, um, let's get on with having a look at this rig. So for those of you that don't follow my channel, I mainly do deep sky astro um, photography. Um, this last few months, this last kind of year, uh, the weather's been pretty terrible. So in the last few months, I have been looking out there for different options of, um, you know, what I could do in terms of um, other avenues of photography. And of course, with respect to Astro, one of the obvious ones is solar, because then at least you have those opportunities during the day when you have good weather, and the sun's up in the sky, you've got another target that you can um, have a look at. Now, of course, I came into this not knowing a lot about solar astrophotography, and I still don't know a lot, but I have, you know, I've been doing some research over the last couple of months, which has led me to where I am now. So the purpose of this video is really just to give you guys a little bit of an overview of what gear I've decided on, why I've decided on it, um, and a little bit of an intro just to a solar photography and a solar rig and what it might look like. So if you're interested in that, I think this could be, um, you know, just an interesting introduction. So look, let's start off with, um, you know, what's the main difference between this and obviously deep sky astrophotography? So for those of you that don't maybe do any deep sky, deep sky astrophotography is where we take long exposures of no, at night time in a very, you know, in what should be a clear sky, hopefully. And we take those long exposures and usually we need many, many hours of those exposures. Anywhere from like, it could be three minutes right up to like 15 minute exposures. But we need many, many, many of those to create many, many hours of data that we can then stack and process to get an image out of. Which is fine when you have lots and lots of clear skies at night, which is something we've had very little of lately. On the other side of the platform is more um, planetary imaging. So that may be, it may be like obviously the planets, it may be lunar imaging, our moon, um, and then you've got solar imaging as well. So what ties all those together is that you're generally taking very short videos of those objects, whether it be the planets, the moon or, or the sun. And with that video where you might be taking, you know, you're probably typically taking at least 50 frames a second. Often you want even more than that. Um, and you're using those videos to then stack those um, you're stacking the images from those videos, those individual frames, you're stacking the best frames that you can and you're then processing that image to get yourself a nice shot of a planet or the moon or in this case it's obviously going to be the sun. So the great thing about that is that you don't need a lot of time so you know you might only need to take 15 seconds, 20 seconds of the sun and then you've got some data to actually work with and begin processing. And, you know, whether that be, whether that be things like prominences that are pictured here, or whether that be, you know, the actual surface of the sun itself or a combination, the point is you don't need, the point is that you don't need very long, which is great when you've got the kind of weather we're having at the moment. So that's why I've gone for a solar setup. Now, let me run you through the gear here because I am rambling a fair bit, which I like to do. So here on the back, we've got our ASI 174 camera. Um, it's a monochrome camera and it's a, it's a planetary style camera. So the good thing about solar astrophotography is you don't necessarily, you don't need a cooled camera for solar, obviously. You're taking, uh, like I said, you're taking video, so you need a planetary style camera 
And the good thing about that is they're often not as expensive as the cooled cameras designed for deep sky astrophotography. Um, in terms of the type of camera, you do want a monochrome sensor. It's much better to just have a mono sensor on this. You don't need a one-shot color style camera. And um, you do need to match up and do a bit of research to match your camera pixel size to the type of telescope that you're using. So what I would advise is do a bit of research and try and match up your, um, there's plenty of information out there, but try and match up your pixel size of your camera to the focal length of your telescope that you're gonna be working with. Um, in my case, because I'm working at, I guess you'd say a kind of a medium to a medium sort of focal length telescope. This is a hundred millimeters F7. So I'm gonna be in fairly close. I wanted a camera that's got reasonably big pixels. So these are 5.8 micron size pixels. But like I said, do your own research. There is also a camera called the ASI 432, which is ideal. You've got really, really big pixels when you're getting up to those really long focal lengths, which, is, um, which could actually be ideal for my setup too but that's what I've got for now. You will need a tilt adapter, so you will often get these Newtonian rings appearing in your image when you're taking images of the sun, and it means you, you need to tilt the sensor on the camera very slightly, so I've got a ZWO tilt adapter here, which is ideal for that. Now next up in our imaging train is the main piece of hardware for solar imaging, and it's a Daystar Quark. So it came in this box here, Daystar Quark, are very, very popular um, accessories that you can um, add onto an existing telescope like I've done here. And they come in various versions. My version here is the chromosphere version. So it's generally it's sort of ideal for taking images of the surface of the sun. However, you can also take the prominences as well. So you tend to find with the Daystar Quark that this chromosphere version is the most popular and that's the one I've gone for. It's very easy to install. You just basically put it straight into your eyepiece um, here, whether you've got a diagonal or whether you've got kind of like an extender like I've got here. I've actually used an old Barlow here and I've taken the Barlow attached, the Barlow lens off the end to just use it to give me some uh, more backspace here. But yeah, it just goes straight in. Like I said, you can put it into your one and a quarter or your two inch, go straight in there like that, pretty straightforward, and you just lock that up. Um, one, thing to take, uh, one thing to take into account is you do need some sort of a, they're referred to as an ERF or an energy rejection filter. Now, there's a lot of information here about ERFs and which ERF you should use and what, um, what type of configuration you should have because you can have an ERF right at the front of the telescope and you can also have an ERF, or you can also have an ERF here um, as your first element of glass before it basically hits the, um, goes into the quark here. So for me, the way I've uh, configured it is I've got a two inch, I've got a two inch ERF here, or rather I've got a two inch UV IR cut filter, which is what's recommended, and that, I've placed on the front of my uh, two inch uh, barrel here. So that's the first element that the light is gonna hit. Now, generally speaking, from what I've read on, on the internet, and like I said, I'm not, I'm not uh, professing to be an expert, but there is a little bit of contention around this, I've noticed. But generally speaking, what is um, said is that, or what is recommended, and I think by Daystar as well, is once you go above 120 millimeters of aperture, you're, you're, um, it's advised or you're recommended to have a front-mounted ERF, so right at the front of the telescope. Now, they are, very, very, they are very expensive, those ERFs. So once you get up to really big apertures, the ERF could cost you nearly as much as the quark. So um, my approach to this is that I've purchased a, rather than put, for example, this day start on my Esprit 120, which is an expensive telescope, I've put it on this SV Boney. It's a second-hand telescope here, but these SV Bonies go for about a thousand Australian dollars. So I think that's maybe about, I don't know, what would that be, 600 American, something along those lines. Um, so I've chosen to get a cheaper telescope. 
it's an acromat because I'm taking images in mono here, so I don't really need a triplet design. An acromat is fine for imaging the sun. In fact, it's recommended in most cases you'll find for imaging the sun. Um, so basically, I've, my telescope, this particular telescope is like um, less than a third of what my Esprit is worth. And I personally feel much more comfortable um, imaging the sun through a, you know, an affordable, fairly cheap acromat like this. And I'll keep this as my dedicated setup for imaging the sun. And I will just use the two inch UV IR cut filter on the quark. I think personally, from what I've read and from what I've heard on the internet, everybody should make their own decision about whether they want to go with a front mounted one or, you know, have one here. But that's my approach to it. Um, next, you will need an, um, or I think it's highly advisable to get an electronic focuser. You know, when you, especially when you're in at this focal length. So I think this is around, I'll have to check, but this is around 700 millimeters. And the Daystar Quark is, uh, has a Barlow built into it, a 4.2 Barlow, which means I'm very, very close in. So you can imagine focus, you're gonna need to be tweaking your focus a lot. So it's very, it's highly advisable just to have an electronic, electronic focuser. You don't wanna be sat out there side baking in the sun, trying to get focus <laughs> and sort of burning to a crisp at the same time. So I think that's highly advisable. You will need like a battery pack. Um, I think I've, I've already been over this, but basically you just need a battery pack because the Daystar Quark, like I said, it needs a couple of amps of power. They give you this micro USB cable. I just have this attached here with a piece of Velcro on the top and um, just make sure it's got the right amperage output your battery pack to power the Daystar. Um, when you do change this little dial on the Daystar here, if you're playing around trying to see if you can get better, um, you know, sort of better image quality, you do need to wait um, a few minutes for the quark to then change, um, basically to get to the right temperature. So that's just a small thing to bear in mind. And like I said, I've already mentioned the, the telescope itself, Anacromat is fine for this kind of imaging. So. Personally, I've gone for this SV Boney because it came up secondhand at a good price. There's also like the Sky Watchers out there. Um, I can't remember exactly what the name is. I think it might be the Evo Stars, but there's the Sky Watcher Acromats, which I know a lot of people I've seen using as well. In terms of the actual aperture of your telescope, um, basically, as I understand it, the closer in, so the more aperture that you're getting, obviously you're gonna be closer into the sun with this uh, 4.2 Barlow. And the closer in you are, the better seeing that you're gonna need. So the one piece of information that was expressed over and over again is when you're imaging the sun, which is a little bit like for the planets as well, or a lot like for the planets, seeing is everything. So your seeing conditions are everything when you're imaging the sun. So it doesn't matter how good your rig is or how good your camera is, if you've got rubbish seeing conditions, there's no point um, in imaging the sun, basically. Now, there's a few nuances to that in that the, the further out you are, so let's say, for example, I'm using a 60 millimeter telescope. Um, there's a lot more, or there's a bit more leeway there, so you can get away with the seeing not being as good. Now, seeing is measured on a scale of one to five, one being very bad and five being very good. So, the closer in you're getting to the sun, the more you want to get into these kind of things where you're really zooming into the sun at a very high focal length, um, the better the, you need your seeing to be. So I've heard it talked about a lot that people won't even bother imaging um, until it's like at least, you know, it's gotta be at least three, and ideally you want it like four or five for when you're getting really close into the sun. So that's the reason I personally went for 100 millimeters because once you go up to 120 and 150 and you're getting in that close, you really need your seeing to be bang on. Like you want a four, five, you know. So 100 millimeter I felt was a nice happy medium. Um, I can still get away probably with my seeing at three now and again, but uh, you know, obviously ideally I want it to be four. Um, if you want to know what your seeing is, just look out there for some apps. Um, I'm using Meteo Blue at the moment as the website where I'm just checking out what the seeing is like. Um, but there's various apps out there. So look, um, 
I think I've covered most of the points here that I've sort of you know written down for myself. Um, like I said, there are dedicated options out there where you can go with a full dedicated scope where it's all integrated into the scope. For me, this made more sense because it gives me that more flexibility. And um, yeah, so I hope that's helped maybe um, make a few things a bit clearer for you guys out there if you are a beginner like I am to solar imaging. And I think to finish off with, I will leave you with a couple of images that I've taken recently. The first images I've taken with this setup and you can see yourselves what kind of a, um, an image you can get with a setup like this. So thank you very much for watching. I hope that's been useful and um, clear skies. Catch you next time.